Table and food, two simple yet sacred things. How often do you and I sit at a table every day and take for granted what it actually means? How often do you and I take meals and we, we just think, well, it's just another meal. We do it three times a day, but it's something so simple, yet something so sacred, so significant. I want you to think for a moment, what are the most important moments in your life that happened around the table. Many of the big things in your life didn't happen on the go, but it actually happened around a conversation at a table. I remember as a, a youngster in the house we grew up in, there was in the kitchen a special little corner that had been built in the house and it had a little wooden kitchen uh, set there. And then half past five, six o'clock as kids, mom would shout, kids come in and eat. And it was custom for us as a family, every night to eat together, every now and then we'd cheat and maybe watch in front of the TV as we do now, but Maria and I also now try and prioritize that dinner is not something for the TV, dinner is something for the family. There's something sacred about a table and people coming together, and so I'll never get that memory shaken of mom calling us to the dinner table. I think of other times, my, I've had many birthdays, but for some reason my 30th birthday comes to mind when I think of a few people that I invited. We went to a restaurant one night and I laughed because they actually sold sushi at this restaurant. And my one friend came to the party and said, I'm going to try sushi for the first time. And he was shocked when his food arrived and he thought, I'm paying that much for that little food. And we had such a laugh at that birthday table, but it was significant. It was my birthday, but it was celebrated with people. I think of the, the first job I got after I had graduated, my brother's friend, um, I was invited to join his company, and so obviously I had to have uh, an interview. It was a bit of an informal one. It was almost guaranteed before we even had the lunch, but I, I met him at a restaurant in Joburg, and we sat, and I think he just more or less wanted to know my story. But I know, I don't know what I ate. I don't know what I drank. But what I do know is we had a conversation around a table, and it was a significant moment. It was my first official hire. I think of last Christmas, we had gotten a new puppy, I think it was in November, and so we took the puppy with to my parents for Christmas, and after Christmas lunch, it was all of us, a family, maybe 12 or so of us, and then my mom was sitting holding our new puppy on her lap, and the puppy kind of got halfway onto the table and just fell asleep on the table, and Maria was on the opposite side, took a photo, and it was a special time for our family. We had this laugh with the little puppy falling asleep, and it, but you see, the table and the food provided that setting. I think of one of the most terrifying settings I've had around the table is when I was dating Maria. And young guys, listen, when you want to propose, you need permission. Amen? All the parents are like, yes. Okay, so, so I knew it was the right thing to do, so I went to Maria's parents. I said, look, and I think they preempted. They knew what the conversation was going to be about. And so Maria's mom was kind enough to, to set up a lunch for us. And so it was going to be this like serious, formal kind of thing. And I had my budget ready, which now I laugh at thinking, how are we ever going to live on that budget? But God's grace got us through. But um, I sat at that table and, and I had to ask her parents for permission. And Maria's mom was so kind. She had actually made us, I think, hamburgers and she had made the mints into heart-shaped little mince patties. And so she made it all. But it happened around a table and a meal. It was significant. My birthday, my first job, my, all this, you know. Tables and food. And, you know, I think we've got to think about this, that, that tables are not just surfaces that hold food, at least not for Christians. If we think of tables, tables have chairs, right? It's not normally just one chair at a table. There's normally a few tables, I mean, a few chairs at a table. And who needs to sit on chairs? People. So we see that tables are symbolic of relationships. What's a table without a, fr a friend or a family? Who, who enjoys dinner alone? Yeah, I thought, no one. Who went this week to a restaurant on your own? No one, unless you're on a work thing and you, you almost have to, but we never really choose to eat alone. We would rather always choose to eat someone. And so tables are symbolic of relationships. Tables are also associated with invitations. 
No one's going to just rock up at your house and say, well, I'm here for lunch. Well, hi, what's your name? <laughs> you won't do that unannounced. You would need an invitation, right? That would be the proper way to come to a table is with an invitation. And this morning I want to remind us that Jesus has set the table that you and I are invited to come and sit at. A table that Jesus has prepared. See, Jesus is no stranger to tables, right? Think of all the scriptures you know. How many times did Jesus do what he did at a table or at least around some food? Listen, almost most of the time it happened that way. We know that <clears throat> Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors. You know those stories? We know that he ate with the religious Pharisees. He maybe didn't enjoy their company, but he knew he had to try and influence those religious people. We know that Jesus feasted at weddings, and what did he do? Some of us like that miracle. What did he do? He changed? Amen. Okay? So he, he did that. That would have been a feast. They would have celebrated. They would have had food at the table. Jesus even had a bit of South African in him, I believe, because he enjoyed a braai. Did he? Yes. Well, we know Peter disowns Jesus. He's standing at the fire three times. His question, do you know him? He said, no, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. So he denies Jesus three times. John 21, you, you read about the story where Jesus reinstates Peter and he says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And it's intentional that he asks him three times because he's denied him three times. But, but what happens at that story? The South African of Jesus comes out. And so the disciples are fishing one night. They catch nothing. No fish. I'm a fisherman. It's disappointing when you spend so many hours out on the water and you catch nothing. So they would have been despondent. They see a man sitting on the, the shore and he says to them, hey, did you catch anything? And they said, nothing all night. And he says to them, well, throw your nets on the right side of the boat. What happens? They catch so many fish, it says that they cannot even haul them in to the boat. Peter then recognizes that it's Jesus, and Peter, the crazy one, jumps into the water, swims to Jesus. The disciples follow in the boat. They arrive on the seashore, and what do they find? A bri. Go read your Bible. Jesus had prepared, prepared a fire with fish and bread. Now, some South Africans will know how good it is to have a snookies bri, okay? a good snook bri. Jesus is like, guys, just come. And I think some of us, we, we, we think God is up there. God is all holy and reverent. Yes, he is, but God was fully man as well. And Jesus understood that tables were more than just surfaces to put food on. Because every conversation, every work of God that he did around food, it was not about the food. It was the spirit of God that was infused in the conversation. And Jesus used it as a, 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 a medium, in a sense, to, to try and communicate something to the people. We know that Jesus fed 5,000 people, right? That had to do with food. There was a basket that day, and the little boy brought his lunch and his fish, and Jesus multiplied it, fed 5,000 women, ex uh, men, excluding women and children. It happened around a meal, and now, what Jesus did there, it wasn't about the food. It was, but it wasn't. Jesus was trying to, behind that miracle, communicate something so much bigger to that crowd, to say, look, I am God. I am the bread of life. I'm the one that provides for you more than just sustenance, but spiritual satisfaction. So it seemed for Jesus that a table meant more than just food, for sure. You know, since the beginning of the year, we, I've had the privilege to, to meet with some of our leaders who I respect, the volunteers in this church, I respect. And so we've just been strategic saying, listen, how do we grow ourselves as leaders? Surely we can grow. Surely we can do better. Surely we've got to love more what God loves most and take care of God's church and, and, and shepherd his people better. So, so we have to meet to do that. And every time we meet, you know what we do first? That's what Christians do. My old Anglican priest said, where Christians meet, they eat, okay? So if you're having a Christian gathering and there's no food, it's not holy, okay? You've, you've got to include food in there. Just kidding. So, but, so what, we'll start our meetings with food, but listen, it's not about the food. The food just helps us get started, but later on what happens is our conversation is infused with the Spirit of God, about the work of God, and that, that meal, that table becomes intentional. It's not just about the food. This week I read an article. Someone said, you know, as Christians, we're so quick to invite people to church. Come to church. You're far from God. Come to my church. Come to my church. And he said, maybe we should learn to... First invite people for dinner before we invite them to church. Maybe just break and warm up the conversation and 
I miss old Helen. Some of you would remember her from church, and she moved on to Neisner. Fantastic old lady, loved to just serve. Such a, such a great heart. And, and she actually served on our information desk. And I remember she would connect with people that have never been to our church at the door. She says, hi, I'm Helen. Do you want to come to my house for lunch today? I'm like, wow, Helen. Like, that's hosp- hospitality. She, like, just brings people into her house, like, immediately. And, and, but maybe she understood something. Maybe she knew that a table was more than just food. It meant a lot more. And so how can we talk about tables in Scripture and not talk about the Last Supper? Jesus' most monumental meal that he ever partook in. Of all that he did, of all the food and all the tables that he sat at, the Last Supper. Most of us, even if you never did art history, you would know that Leonardo da Vinci had painted the Last Supper, and it sits in somewhere in Italy today. It's actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and they said that that painting, I think it was painted in the 1400s, could be corrected, they said that thing is worth $450 million. Any takers? You, you just want it up in your lounge. You've got $450 million lying around to purchase that beautiful painting. But, but listen, not even, there's non-Christians that recognize that. They, they realize, no, that was a significant meal. That, it's, that has been carried for centuries. And you know what? What happened that night was not about food. It was not about food. We know it was about food. They had dinner together. But it was about so much more than just a meal. So let's read the story. Luke 22. It says, Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Remember, Jesus was Jewish. So Jews, Jesus would have celebrated Jewish festivals and customs. It was what he did. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, listen here, he said what? This monumental meal. He said, take this and divide it among you. We're like, Jesus, that's obvious. We, we always share the food. See, but he was about to communicate something of eternal value. He said, for I tell you that I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body. Imagine you and I, just put yourself in that room, dark thing, little Lights, candles flickering there, and Jesus says, yeah, this is my body. This is my body given for you. See, it was an, he was illustrating something of value to them, of weight to them. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Sorry. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. And he said, drink of it, drink of my blood. See, Jesus used the table to illustrate something so deep. And it was the scholar N.T. Wright, he said, when Jesus was trying to teach his disciples about what he was about to do, he said he didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal. See, you and I are smart with our theories, but we, we can't communicate what Jesus could communicate the way that he did it. It was brilliant. And he didn't give them a theory. He said, guys, let's just have supper. Let's just sit at a table. Let's just have a meal. And I want you to grasp something about what I'm about to do. And so we read this and it says it took place at Passover. And you think, well, what is Passover? Anyone? You're like, I don't know what that is. Feast of unleavened bread. I don't know. And so Passover was that Jewish festival where where they commemorated, where they remembered that one day they were slaves in Egypt, right? If you know the story. And they were enslaved under Pharaoh's 
strong hand. And they were, it was oppressive. It wasn't nice to be there. And then God says, I'm going to deliver my people. And he calls Moses and he says, go tell Pharaoh what? To let my people go. You know the story. And how did he do that? He sent 10 plagues, right? Of all those things. And then Pharaoh's heart was so hard and he just kept the Israelites. And eventually we know that he released them after the final plague. And so, so let's read what happened at Passover, actually. Exodus 12. Verse 1 to 14 says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. See, it had to be the best. It had to be spotless. You couldn't give God, in that instance, your, the lamb at the back of the pack, the one that had the broken leg or the skin disease or a missing horn. It says, no, 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 the one without defect, the one that cost you the most, bring that one. That's the one that you've got to bring to God. We can learn from that. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then now to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with the bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. He says, this is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. To remember how they had to exit Egypt so quickly. He says, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And here, yeah, on that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The authority that God has. It says, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will, I will pass over. You will be protected that when the angel of death comes, he will know that this house is marked. Blood has been covered. You are going to be safe. The firstborn of your house and of your flock will not be killed. You will be spared. God was favoring his people. He says, no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate, to remember. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. We are never told to take Passover away. Now, we may not practice it as Jews. We call it communion today. But we read these words, lamb, without defect, slaughtered, blood, bitterness of death. What happened? Jesus was here sitting at this monumental table with his disciples on that last night before he was betrayed. And he was saying, guys, you need to know this. What was he saying? That he was saying that he is that spotless lamb, without defect. We know Jesus was sinless. That's why he could take away the sin of the world. He, was, he had no defect, nothing wrong with him. He was slaughtered. His blood was shed so that our sins could be forgiven. So that one day when judgment comes again, what's going to happen? Because we are covered by Christ's blood, because we have faith in him, judgment will what? Pass over us. That we will be spared as God's people. We will be spared. We don't have to give an account. God will take care of us. And, and we won't face eternal death. That we will live forever that's the hope we have as Christians, isn't it? The hope of the resurrection. And so this is communion. This is communion. The Passover that Jesus had with his disciples. And each time you and I get to take in communion, however we do it, different churches do it different ways, what we actually are doing is reminding ourselves that we once lived in Egypt. Our Egypt was a place of slavery under sin. Where just as Israel was oppressed under Pharaoh, you and I were oppressed under Satan's heavy hand. 
that we had no nature, desire in us to, to serve God. We did anything. We were slaves to sin. But because of the grace of God, he makes us through Christ, what? Slaves to righteousness. And so whenever we do communion, remember, I was once a slave. I once lived without the hope of Jesus Christ. But God sent a deliverer. God sent Moses to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. We know that God sent his son, the greatest deliverer ever, to set you and I free. Moses set the Israelites free. Where did they go? Canaan, the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Where does our deliverer get us? He gets us into on earth in a land of freedom, spiritually. You, you and I can live an abundant life here on earth in the spirit. But we also live with the promise of eternity. That heaven is our home. That you and I are just passing through. Please don't live your life trying to settle here. You will be disappointed. God has said we are passing through. Our lives on earth are 80 years if our strength endures. And by the way, they fly away. And then we go home to be with the Lord in the promised land. How do we get there? Only through the hope of a deliverer. Only Jesus can get us into that promised land. And that's why I think at communion time, you and I are so guilty. I'm guilty of just doing it so quickly. Think it was just another slot in the service. Let's quickly drink the juice, drink the cup, and we forget the gravity, this monumental meal that Jesus has invited us to, to come and sit at his table. You know, every time you and I share communion, something must shift within us. Something has to happen. I challenge myself when I come to church. I lead the church. Every time I worship, I will never sing a song. I will worship God. I will come hungry. I'm, I, I need God's spirit to move in me. When I come to the communion table, I say, Lord, forgive me. And, and maybe if I had a good week and I felt I didn't really do anything big and wrong, then I can just say, Lord, thank you that you saved me. Thank you, Lord, that I was hopeless without you. And this is my remembering of what it was like to live 21 years of my life without Jesus in the dark and without hope. Jesus, thank you for delivering me. And at the end of service today, we're going to have just over five minutes just for us to sit and to remind ourselves of what Jesus has done for us. See, so we have to understand Passover to understand what communion is. And Corinthians, Paul, he, he writes to the church there, and in the message translation, verse 26 of chapter 11, he says, you will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. We're not going to have to do communion in heaven, by the way, because we're going to be with Jesus. It's something for us now on earth that we do as often as we need to. And then it says this, you must never let familiarity breed contempt. Never let this become normal. It's dangerous for us to think this is just communion. No, it's not. It's the most marvelous meal that you and I are invited to share in at the table that Jesus prepares, and that's the table called salvation. Paul said to the Corinthians, he warned them, he said, you need to be careful that you don't drink this in an unworthy manner. He says, you can't make light of this. The Corinthians turned this thing upside down. It says that they were having, and it, they didn't do communion like us, by the way. They literally had like meals together. That's what it would have looked like to share in communion. But it says, some are coming to your feasts, and they're going home hungry. Others are coming and they're getting drunk. So they drank too much of this. We just give you a little bit and at least it's grape juice. So you're safe here. I grew up in the Anglican church. We had like a hard tack. We had, we had sherry, okay? And my brother and I loved communion at age eight. <laughs> no jokes. But don't let familiarity breed contempt. Don't do this in an unworthy manner. So how do you not draw near to the communion table in a worthy manner? Number one, we must know that we are unworthy, that we have no foot to stand on, that it's only because of the grace of God that we can come and partake. So we say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Then we've got to check our hearts to say, am I really a Christ follower? Am I being a hypocrite? Have I got sin in my life that's unconfessed? That Have I got something in my life that I'm not willing to repent of? Then maybe we need to check our hearts before we share in communion. Let's not make light of this. You know, all those tables I mentioned earlier, my, my first job interview, Christmas, the others, they all spoke about a meal that offered sustenance to my body. But we, we've got to think this, this table of salvation that Jesus invites us to is not one that nourishes our bodies. 
Because we would disappoint you if all we gave you was a wafer on Sunday and you're like, I'm going home hungry. It's not the point. It's, it's symbolic of what Jesus gives us. Revelations 3. As we said, tables come with chairs. Chairs come with people. Tables come with invitations. You and I don't just rock up at Jesus' table and say, well, here I am. He says, no, you get invited. And how, who gets invited? Everyone, in fact. For God so loved the world that he... Not, he didn't die for the Christians. He died for the world. Jesus came not to condemn sinners, but to save them. That's the good news. God loves you as a sinner. Okay? But he doesn't want you to stay as a sinner. But God loved the world. And now listen to this. There's an invitation for everyone to come sit at the table. Revelation 3.20. Jesus said, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. You see, it's, it's a response. You and I are never forced into a relationship with God. We choose it. He will, never, he will never say, Jock, you will be in a relationship with me. You will be saved. You will follow me. He says, no, I would like you to. It requires a response. He says, I will come in, Jesus said, and eat with that person. Jesus uses the language of food again to describe our relationship with him. He says, it's not just, it's, it's, it's one where we eat together. He says, and eat with that person and they with me. And so Jesus wants far more from us than just to come to church on a Sunday. Jesus wants to come and live in each one of our hearts. Now, this may be obvious for many, but for some it's saying, really? Is my relationship with God supposed to mean so much more than just going to church? Yes. Going to church is like this bigger part of your relationship with God. It, he wants to consume your whole life. And communion is a reminder for us of that. Jesus, John chapter 6, said, I am the bread of life. Again, Jesus uses food to communicate a truth. He says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So what happens at the table of salvation? What happens is there's a few things. You know, our spirits get to feast on the most glorious buffet called grace. I remember the Boma it used to be at Emerald Casino. I went there once. You pay your 200, 250, whatever it is, you can pig out. You can eat as much as you want. And you think this is some of the best food I've ever had. They even have sushi if you get spoiled. And you just like this buffet. Listen, when we come to the table of salvation, Jesus says you get to eat the best of the best. That what I can give you at this table, Jesus says, you will not find anywhere else. You cannot. I'm the bread of life. There's other breads you can eat. But I'm the bread of life. It's at the table of salvation where you and I find soul satisfaction. You and I know what it's like, either lunchtime or if you go to a buffet, you eat, you get full, and then you go. And if you're Afrikaans, you say, Mach is full, Ugh is too. What does it mean? It said you're so full that now you are at rest. God says, I will fill you so much that you will find true rest for your souls. See, when we, when we go to different, the wrong tables in life, you say, I'm going to go eat at this table thinking it's going to fill me up. Every time we eat at those tables, we come back disappointed. We think, I'm still hungry. We run to fame, just a bit more attention. We eat and we eat and we eat and we're never satisfied. We go to fortune, thinking more money, more money, more money, bigger job, more money. Then I'm going to be satisfied. Then you come back, you think, man, I'm still thirsty. What's wrong with the table? What's wrong with the meal? We go to fantasy. We think, if I can just do this or have this or experience that. Or, and we think, but I'm still hungry. Jesus says, yeah, you, you're eating at the wrong table. We're meant to eat from one table for soul satisfaction. It's the table of salvation where you and I get to eat from this buffet called grace. So there's a seat for each one of us at this table. It's ongoing. Maybe you've never taking a step to come and sit at that table. Today could be your day. For many of us, we sit at this table all the time. And we're like family. We know the benefits of sitting at this table. We think, why didn't I come earlier? Why did it take me so long? There's a table for you at the seat. And at this table, we, we find God's grace. And it's a grace that doesn't just cover us. And it's also a grace that empowers us to live the life that God has called us to live. What I've learned as well is that, as we said, tables are about people, there's chairs. See, for us, 
the table of salvation is not one that we just eat at alone. It's fellowship. You, you and I as the church, we've got to learn to do fellowship together, to understand, listen, tables are more than food for us as the church because we understand this, this thing. We understand what it's like to come to God and do life together. We understand the power of meals together. We need to change the way that we do food, I think. So communion is not a slot in the service. Communion is a sacred moment. And we're going to partake in a sacred moment. You need to understand that it's a holy moment. It's not just a slot in the service. Something we quickly do. We include it once a month, maybe every now and then an extra service. No, no, no. We're going to slow down. We're going to immerse ourselves in Jesus this morning. And one thing I must say is that communion is not a funeral. Jesus died. Jesus is resurrected. He lives in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. He is not dead. So we're not mourning. We don't mourn at communion time. And I think for many people, that's what we think communion is. We're somber. And it's, it's not a funeral. It's actually a celebration where you and I come and we say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you that you have taken the punishment of sin from me. That I don't have to like answer for my own sin. Jesus, you were punished for my sin. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. That must require thanksgiving. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that when I was at my worst, that's when you came to find me. To extend your love to me. So Paul said this, 1 Corinthians 11. In a moment, we're going to stand to our feet and invite you to come forward to one of our tables. Thank God COVID's finished. We can do communion differently again. And each one, take a small goblet of grape juice. There's a small bread roll there. Don't rush. Go back to your seat. Prayerfully consider the Passover. Jesus, the lamb without blemish, slaughtered. At twilight, deliverer, all these things. And Jesus, thank you for what you did for me. And before we stand, let me read 1 Corinthians 11. It says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces. Just imagine sitting at that table, that monumental meal, when Jesus said, Guys, this is my body. And he knew what that meant for him just a couple hours later, what would happen to his body. He said, this is my body, guys, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For each time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. See, it's something we need continuously. And I want us maybe as we share communion this morning to immerse ourselves in that, that little room, that upper room with Jesus and his disciples and where you and I keep company with these 12. And Jesus says, Andrew, this is my body given for you, broken for you. This is my blood. Drink of it. It speaks about a covenant, a promise. That even when you and I are faithless, God will remain faithful. That's a covenant. It's not a contract. God says, I will fulfill my promise to you. I love you. I will redeem you. Come to the table. Each one of us. Where our souls can be satisfied. The monumental meal that we will find nowhere else. An invitation that no one else can send us. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. And so Lord, we just thank you for your presence. That you're present with us, your church now, that we are never alone. That right now we feel your tangible presence, your spirit with us. Not just the spirit that comforts, but a spirit empowers us, that calls us up. It calls us to greater things. The Spirit that gives us hope and purpose and so much more. Maybe for you it's time that you open that door for Jesus. 
and allow Him to come and live in your heart, dwell there forever. It's your choice. It's a response you make. And for those of us sitting at that table already, let's not leave. Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. There's nothing better than to sit at that table. There's not another bread that can satisfy our hunger. There's not another wine that can quench our thirst. But Jesus Christ. And Lord, this morning we declare, we remember that you are enough for us, Lord. And that you are our great deliverer, Lord. And that we can't wait to enter our promised land with you. Give us strength here in the wilderness, Lord. Provide for us that manna and the quail that we know we need, God. We bless your name this morning. We all said, Amen. Come to the table. Don't just come to the table, invite others to the table as well. So I think you and I can leave today challenged to thinking that tables are more than just flat surfaces that hold food. That for you and I as believers, tables could become so much more sacred, so much more significant. And I know Maria and I this week were invited to one dinner at least, but, but we thought, I want to put the challenge out there. Why don't you, if you've never invited someone in the church for a dinner, and have a spirit-infused meal with one another and see what God does. Maybe it's a little awkward at first, but trust me, just do it and see how God might bless that space and just strengthen fellowship. And so if you take that challenge, let us know. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. But church, don't rush. After church, we've got hot dogs, there's coffee, there's good company, and we wish you the best of weeks. Sit at the table every day. God bless.